so uh, the, the title of this talk is No Time to Waste, and we really wanted to focus on what brought us to this space, what are the core attributes of this technology that are really exciting, and kind of how do we get back to that place and, and really eliminate some of the distraction that I think yeah. has emerged in yeah. the last 10 years yeah. <laughs> or 11 years. So for me, I started off as a banking lawyer, banking and finance, and representing hedge funds and big banks, et cetera. And I became very interested in how you move money across borders, which as anyone knows, is not an easy thing to do. From there, I moved out here to the Valley and I began focusing on moving philanthropic dollars across borders, which is an even more difficult thing to do as anyone who's worked in that space knows, uh, and became kind of obsessed with the difficulties in that. So then, as you know, I launched a product uh, that was focusing on getting money across the border. It had KYC and AML attributes, but also was just thinking through the complexities around proof of organizational status and how you actually justify the belief that you are a legitimate recipient of this kind of funding and a legitimate donor of this kind of funding. And from there, uh, I became general counsel of the place where I incubated, we incubated that particular product, and became very interested in privacy, data privacy and protection for nonprofit organizations in particular, and the protection of sensitive information from, frankly, everyone who might want to use that information for ill, be that a government, a private actor, et cetera. And that got me really into privacy, which is something that we really share. And um, from there, it was kind of a very logical extension to become obsessed, as one does, with blockchain <laughs> technology and the promise that it held not only for more frictionless or a reduction of friction in financial transactions, particularly in the cross-border space, but also around enhanced security for privacy yeah. considerations. Yeah. So, and I know your journey was different, but with similar characteristics. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and it's so interesting to see, because we have a very different background, <laughs> that we actually came to the space with a really concrete problem that we saw. Um, like for me, it was in um, uh, 2013 with the Snowden revelations and really seeing um, how, how bad bad it is what's happening online and um, looking for, for a solution to that. And people back at the time, it was just when um, people started to more conceptualize Bitcoin and, and what you could otherwise do with it and, and the idea of Ethereum came along. So that, that was what brought me into this. So um, like the hope for building better infrastructure, decentralized infrastructure for sharing data. And, and uh, um, that's where it started. So I worked for a while for Ethereum, and then these days um, at Parity, we're really focused on further pushing the technology and making it um, a lot more usable um, for the various use cases. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's interesting that we both have this strong security interest yeah. you know, from very different places. Yeah. And it's interesting to me to see how we're, I think, I feel like the ecosystem is getting back to that a little bit. Like yeah. we had this kind of, you know, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to describe the, the, the insanity of the past couple of years, but. I am at least heartened, and I feel like that directional shift is happening back to these kind of core attributes and core use cases. Yeah. Do you agree? And it's really still, for me, one of the key promises, like making better systems. Like, when I remember um, the DAO hack, um, so um, maybe some people remember that the uh, that promise of building with smart contracts a decentralized organization on Ethereum, and then it had, like, unfortunate mm -hmm. bugs um, that were exploited. Um, and so, yeah, showed the shortcomings of the tech at the time, but at the same time, the interesting thing was um, because it's all open source, because it's decentralized, um, what it really meant is that a lot of people could work together at um, tracking down what the issue is. Like, um, and that was very different to what I was used to from computer security, like where everything happens um, uh, behind closed doors and like companies don't disclose everything, um, which exposes really all of us um, and our data. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. I think all of these concepts are generalizable to the broader society at large. And so I think one of the things that we're really excited about at the forum is the potential of this technology to really benefit the world. And so whether it's enhanced financial inclusion or things like that, or even just the reduction of certain kinds of costs that are distracting from uh, core cases like philanthropy, for example, I think there are these opportunities that I know that you're also mm -hmm. focusing in on in the product build that are, that are about that, that are about like how do we take systems that were designed in certain ways and certain, with certain ideas in mind and how do we not only put into place a better process and structure around how we actually instantiate these kinds yeah. of things, but also how do we ensure that we're wrapping them in an appropriate 
ecosystem, like a poli I would say from our perspective, it's the policy ecosystem that is actually going to shepherd this new technology in a way that's going to not mimic the, I think, errors of previous yeah. generations of, of tech. And really learning from the practical experience, right? Like deploying it in controlled yeah. environments and then learning from what happens. I mean, that, that was really the interesting thing when we started to work with the World Food Program. And, and even though it was like a very simple system and initially um, uh, just a few number of nodes, and now it's like growing and becoming more decentralized. But it showed what you really can do and, and how, how, this, how this really works instead of just starting with big promises. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think the good thing about this is like because there isn't this sort of flood of capital, you know, coming in anymore, let's call it, and capital, you know, I think um, there is this ability to kind of almost under-promise and over-deliver yeah. that we've gotten back to, which I think is so core yeah. to actual success and yeah. execution, yeah. you know. Um, so one of the things I think we're really excited about is, is this idea of what a ledger might bring to the anti-corruption space. So this is work that we're doing actively right now in the country of Colombia in, in partnership with the Colombian government at Inter-American Development Bank. And we're really focusing on the transparency attributes of a blockchain. And so one of the things I think is interesting is that there is this naivete in the space still, mm. right? Particularly among policymakers that this technology is a silver bullet. And so sometimes we talk to policymakers in certain governments who say, well, if we put it on a blockchain, then everyone can see everything and everything will be fine. It'll be a much better system. <laughs> and we'll prove that we're very forward leaning and we're into the technology and we're like, we're, you know, we're elevating our country in the eyes of the global economy. And we say, that's an interesting philosophy, you know, but that's, that's not the case. Uh, and particularly with the aspect of transparency, one of the things I know we've chatted about briefly is this idea that just because you can see something, it doesn't mean you're accountable for what you see. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you even know what to do with what you see. And so one of the things that we're focusing on is how do you actually educate the average individual? Or even better, how do you educate a more educated user, like a journalist, for example, as to what they're seeing? And so if you have access to a transaction record and you don't know what that actually means, you can't do anything with it and you can't hold anybody accountable. And so there's always this need to consider the context of a deployment to ensure that it's going to actually hit hard and have the impact that you're intending to have it have. And I know this is the case in your World Food Program work as well, even thinking about these kinds of things too. I think it's a really good point, I mean, around education and making sure that people really understand like what, what you can, what you can't do. Like there's a lot of misunderstanding and still so many buzzwords around. Like, um, and yeah, and I think we can still do a much better job at, getting this right? I think all of us can. You know, I, even just the most recent confusion between you know, what's a cryptocurrency versus a stable coin versus yeah. digital currency in the popular press is very challenging. Because I think for those of us that understand those distinctions and know and can orient appropriately to various opportunities or products that are launching in this space, it can be very frustrating to yeah. feel like you have to go back to basics and do that core yeah. level of education. Yeah. yeah. And really, I mean, also with the, with the view on like that there are so many problems that the technology could help solve. I mean, it's not the single element, like the single thing yeah. um, in the solution, but, um, but then there's so much distraction and like so much noise and yeah. 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 So how do you feel like you're, you're dealing with that when it comes to parity? I mean, we've been always focused on, on building the best tech that we can. I mean, I love that you brought up the under promise over deliver because that's, yeah. that's one of the core values at the company, like really trying to build the best tech and enable a lot of um, the innovation that can happen as a platform technology. So um, coming from the core of open source and, um, and providing the developers in the space so they can experiment with new technologies as they come along. Um, and that's been the, really the, the, the core motivation um, for everybody in, in the company. So um, enabling as many people as we can to use these tools um, and, and drive the innovation forward. Mm. And we're seeing the same thing, I think, with governments. So we've always had the presumption and the, the assumption, really, that the frontier economies, like places that could actually leapfrog or benefit from this technology, be the places where we saw more innovation. And I think that's proven to be the case. I mean, I think a lot of these more forward-leaning countries are not really the G7. I mean, I think there has to be accommodation in uh, the global community around um, this technology and its reality, that it's coming, it's not going anywhere, it is real. You know, all of that, I think, we've, we've finally seasoned, I yeah. think, the world for that kind of message, and I don't think it's something we have to hit hard again and again. But I do think that there is not enough attention paid uh, by, let's call it, 
you know, some of the major players in this space to what's happening in some of these economies that are a little under the radar. Yeah. Um, and I think it's unsurprising, I think, and I think you agree, is that that's where this innovation is happening. But I think part of what we feel responsible to do is to surface you know, yeah. some of those ideas. Yeah. I was thrilled to see Bermuda's announcement very recently about adoption digital currency and accepting that. I think they've been working for quite a while, both on the record space and also in the currency space. And this is going to be a really exciting experiment to see how this goes when they're accepting you know, US-backed yeah. currency. And see. I really love that at the core where like, the builders are in the space that there's also still so much uh, sharing of experience going on, like really yeah. genuine learning and, and trying to push that forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think like we're, we're always we were talking about how these speakers' rooms are so interesting, you know, because you you really get to get into the weeds with people that you don't get to see that often about like exactly what's happening with their bills and what's happening in their country, etc. And it's it's exciting to see how we are, where we are now versus a year ago at the same conference, and how much has changed and shifted, uh, and just how much more practical yeah. everything really is. Yeah. You know, is is really exciting. Yeah. So one of the the things I'm excited about to see like in the next coming years is how um, like new features of the technology like on-chain governance, what, what we're developing will play out. I think that will um, open up the design space like by yeah. <laughs> on a whole different level. Well, wide open. Um, yeah. So yeah. really, and, and establish the technology as a, um, as a, a, a platform for innovation, like without, without a good governance system. Um, I mean, I guess for some of the systems, like like Bitcoin, it's it's part of it's a feature. Like you don't want governance, so it, it can't move, it, it can't develop. But then it, it will also only serve this this sort of single use case. But when it comes to like ex yeah. exploring what you could really do, like you need governance to be able to to change and um, and iterate on the system and have like a set of rules how this works. That's right. And governance is also key to accountability. It's core to accountability. If you don't actually have any structure in place, you don't actually know where to go when something actually goes awry in terms of, like you say, if there's bugs that can be fixed, you have to figure out how to do that. I, you know, I, my perception anyway is, and I'm a governance junkie, but I feel like Governance isn't like the dirty word that it used to be. I mean, if you said governance on stage like three years ago, you'd be like, you know, people, <laughs> you'd be all over the place. Um, but now I feel like people are kind of have come around a little bit, or at least there's a warming to the idea that hey, governance isn't evil. The same way that you know regulation isn't necessarily evil as long as you're educating the regulator. And I mean, my view continues to be that if you work with a regulator, you're going to get to a better place than if you let the regulator kind of guess as to what you're doing. Yeah. Now, I know there's different openness by different regulators to different kinds of structures, but for the most part, we are finding that there's an increased willingness to collaborate across the private and public sectors, and that is true regardless of the industry that's being touched on, whether it's supply chains or whether it's uh, currency and payments or whether it's even identity. I think there is a little more of this openness to discussion. On the other hand, of course, you have certain regulators that are coming out hard and are doing things like filing suit, you know, the things that we know have been happening in this space this year, which uh, I do think unfortunately undermines some of that, that collaborative environment that we're, we're starting to see. Are you experiencing that as well in any fashion? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, um, that I'm really interested to see now play out with on-chain governance is like um, that, that early idea of, of programming, really programming like rules into the system and like building a lot better institutions by using the technology. So actually um, removing the trust and having like a lot more truth um, and not having to rely on false promises. Yeah, so what would you love to see happen in on-chain governance? Like if you could kind of paint almost an ideal scenario for what it might look like. And I don't mean specific, but I mean like as a general rule, the trend, what would you want to see happen? I think from a philosophical perspective, I mean, the real thing that on-chain governance and upgradability allows is for the system to evolve. Because um, otherwise, I mean, really, you take a Darwinian perspective, like without, the, without um, a clear set of, um, I mean, rules or natural laws mm -hmm. in biology um, that you can understand and, and, then, um, and then see how the system evolves. Like, it's just going to get stuck, and we've seen that for the existing yeah. systems. I mean, and as I said, like for some, it's a feature. So, and and how this will allow, especially when it then comes to um, chains that can interoperate and and therefore bring scalability to the system, like yeah. how we can comp compartmentalize um, 
um, the governance in the different domain-specific chains. I think that's that's really um, what I'm excited about. Like you have you have the interoperability, you have the composability by design, and then seeing how you apply this in the different settings. So that sort of artificial dichotomy between like private chains and public chains like yeah, vanishes yeah, yeah. and you get like a whole new range of things that you can now um, all of a sudden innovate on. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. I think there is this acknowledgement of reality that not everyone is going to be able to at the same time move onto a blockchain, whether permission or public officials. I mean, leaving all that aside, like there's just, there's different capabilities, there's different appetite, there's different funding, there's just, all of that is going to be different. So how do we acknowledge the reality that we're going to be interoperating among these different kinds of systems, all of them? And how do we, I mean, our, our view is how do you create policy that actually enables that to happen more fluidly and without kind of the fear, I think, that a lot of enterprises yeah. in particular have, right? Well, if my blockchain talks to <laughs> another enterprise's blockchain, what's going to happen? Like, this is going to be a disaster, you know? And so what we're trying to do is kind of work in those interstitial spaces and say, well, actually, it's just a matter of policy concerns. It's a matter of establishing via your traditional legal contract, like, where does liability lie? And these are all things that are heavily negotiated all the time. It's not different now just because you're working with a blockchain. Like, that doesn't actually change a lot of the ways that you would talk about this. And I think there's, you know, that's a slower build, I think, but I think we are seeing a little more comfort um, a lot of, um, in that kind of that kind of space as well. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And I think there's also the sense on the like with all the the, the bad things that happen um, happen in in the past, like the Cambridge Analytica scandals and whatnot. I think there's um, among like a, a bigger set of technologies, like a sense that they want to engage and like be more mindful about what they build and build better systems that actually serve serve people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been interesting to see this shift in thinking from even some of the big tech companies mm -hmm. around discussion or, or open acknowledgement of the fact that they are paying a lot of attention to blockchain, whether that is something as profound as, you know, Calibra, like we just heard from Kevin, or whether it's a more subtle kind of acknowledgement that, yeah, I mean, digital currency backed by a blockchain is something that we're looking at, you know, that you're getting from some of the other companies. I think there is a little bit more... Um, acknowledgement of that, which, and of course, if they're willing to say publicly that level, of course, you, you can understand that there's a lot of thinking going on. And again, I, I, we're finding that with governments as well, mm -hmm. that, you know, most of the governments that we speak to, which is a lot of them, are, they have somebody within their ministry of trade or finance or transformation or whatever, or even technology or the CTO, who is paying very close attention to what's happening in this space and particularly to governance. Mm. particularly, because that is where the intersection with regulation becomes very profound. Yeah. And without governance, it's very hard for a regulator to have anything to grab onto, because they don't regulate technology, they don't regulate code, they regulate some of these mechanisms that are designed to enhance inclusion or create accountability. And without that to grab onto, I think it's why you see some of this almost haphazard engagement by regulators around the world, because they don't really know where to, where to focus. Yeah, and so, now with on-chain governance, like you can actually um, like, so before, like similar to like, you could have a private and a, a public chain, like before you could have like a completely centralized or decentralized system. Like now you, you can have like a wider range of, um, of different systems and experiment um, at that level. So, so that's gonna be interesting to see how, how um, like more, more agile ways of, um, of adjusting the system all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So without naming anything specific, unless you, feel so inclined, you know, what are, I was I'm curious, what are things, either use cases or, or other that are making you either nervous or that you think are just distracting from the main goal here, the main <laughs> direction? Is there anything specific in terms of that kind of thing that you're finding frustrating, let's say? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's like always, always hypes, like, it, but I think in the end, I mean, even with with Libra, and I guess they just mm -hmm. talked before this. It's good because it, it does, it, it has helped, I think, educate around the nuances. Yeah. So I try to see the, the, <laughs> the long-term positive <laughs> aspect of it. Yeah, and I think that's my view too, right? I mean, I think, I think it's easy for us to forget who are deep in this space that it's still really unknown to the average yeah. person. And I don't even mean the average like lay person, like you know, my grandmother lay person. I mean like the average person paying attention to technology, yeah. right? It's still very new and it's still scary to a yeah. lot of people. And so, yeah, I, I love the fact there's more publicity around this kind of technology. And the more we talk about it, the more familiar it gets and the more people are willing to accommodate experiments, whether successes or failures, which I think is important. Yeah, I mean, especially with, with Libra, like the fact that people were now 
really um, open to spending like a lot of time and really understanding yeah. what, what it can, what it can't do, and, and not like um, not just be blinded by the branding of this is a blockchain and really it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but all these, yeah. And I also think it's really fascinating to kind of see what people don't know, what they still don't understand. I mean, I talked earlier about this, just this fundamental difference between a stable coin and a cryptocurrency. Like, people have no idea. They really don't know. And it's not, I don't think, willful ignorance. I think it is our responsibility as people that have a platform in this space to kind of understand that we have to really go back to basics and do some of that core education and bring along some of these other actors in the space who are going to be critical to the embedding of this technology. Yeah. You know, and I mean, really, forward. even with like all the all the ICO hype and then the bear markets after, like, I mean, what I what what's now great about it is like the people that are still in this, like they they yeah. are the ones that have like the true always believers. Been <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're not going anywhere. You know, it's like you were saying earlier. I mean, you get a seat on a rocket ship, you just take the seat. You know, and. and we're all on this ride, I think, to kind of see where we go. But it's heartening to see more and more people joining on, but joining on not with this kind of, I'm here to make a ton of money, or I'm here to yeah. you know, uh, talk about this stuff without really understanding it, but really trying to dive into it and get to that really important place of understanding. Yeah. In particular, people with a non-technical background, like yeah. Yeah, when it now comes to governance systems. and I think that's right. Yeah. 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 And I think for us seeing, you know, we're always, I think the forum's fundamental premise is that you can go further together. And so we try to bring different sectors together, whether it's civil society, the public sector, private sector together, academics, we always try to create these multi-stakeholder collaborations. Um, and part of what's been interesting is seeing, I think people are starting to, to clearly see the roles that their particular sector can play, yeah. which has been, I think, uh, I, I, I credit the Libra Association tremendously with kind of trying to bring together and create that sort of cross uh, sector collaboration around something as exciting and scary as <laughs> as currency and payments. Yeah. So yeah. So what's next for you? Um, so next for us is um, the launch of a new protocol called Polkadot. Um, so really, um, I would say like sort of the third generation of of blockchain tech. So mm -hmm. looking at like Bitcoin and then Ethereum as a smart contract platform, and this has now now a bunch of further features on scalability, so really looking forward to that next year. Yeah. Oh, great. And for our part, we're really excited about a central bank digital currency toolkit that we're launching towards the end of this year, the beginning of next year, and the transparency project that I mentioned in Colombia, along with some supply chain work we've been doing. So we're thrilled about that, and we're starting to get more engaged in India and China, too. So yeah. we're starting to integrate and yeah. talk a lot to the Chinese government and regulators about what's happening there to get a little bit more of a global perspective into the work that they're doing, too. So lots going on as always. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it's such a pleasure to see you. Yeah. Take you all the chat. <laughs> Thank you all.